All right, and on that note, let's uh, jump into some demos here before I pass it off to Brooke. We're gonna look at 3D paint and physics simulation. And I'm gonna go ahead and start by pulling up our 3D paint scenes. Uh, I'm gonna grab this one just so I can kind of show you guys what the end result looks like. This is the scene I built for our demos. If you'd like to play around with any of these scenes, when you start Keyshot, your welcome window will pop up. If not, go ahead and hit that hotkey W while you're inside Keyshot. And then under the demo scenes, you're gonna find our 3D paint barrels, you'll find physics simulation, and you'll also find CMF, which Brooke is gonna talk upon a little bit when we get there. So again, if you guys wanna play around with it and see what that material graph looks like or the final product, uh, you can just grab it from our demo scenes. But as you can see here, we have quite a few different layers of patina, scratches, rust, um, things get a little complicated. I can show you the material graph, uh, but really at the end of the day, this is just uh, a bunch of labels and our, our 3D paint that's attached to the top. Um, I'm gonna go and jump into another scene here that is a simplified version of this, just so we can get a little bit of a, a cleaner start. So I've kind of patinaed this already, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna delete some of that so you guys can get an idea of what's going on. So really all that's happened here is I've added one layer for my, my corrosion, and we'll talk about that. And I've also added a 3D paint node with the rust applied uh, to it as well. So I, within the 3D paint node, have created two different layers here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna delete my coverage layer, and we're gonna start from scratch here. So when I'm, actually, you know what? Let's, let's start from scratch entirely. So if I have nothing attached and I just have my entire model set up here and I wanna start by throwing some 3D paint on there, uh, I can go ahead and I can right click, select my textures and pull my 3D paint from here. Now I'm working inside the material graph. So uh, this is my, my preference when I'm working in Keyshot. I think it's just a really visual way to work, but you don't have to be inside the material graph to accomplish the same thing. If I'm under my material tab, I can go under my textures and then I can right click on any of these inputs and I can select my 3D paint from there, or I can just go to the texture dropdown and select my 3D paint from the texture dropdown. What's really nice about 3D paint is it actually interfaces with pretty much every input uh, attached to one of your materials, whether it's roughness or specularity, you're still gonna be able to, to drive those uh, uh, inputs using your 3D paint node. And if you look, once my 3D paint opens here, uh, the settings for 3D paint are identical, whether you're inside the material graph or you're not. So you're not gonna be missing out on anything if you're working from the actual uh, material tab. It is just, in my opinion, a little bit more efficient and, and visibly easier way to work from the material graph. So I'm gonna be working in the material graph. So I've applied my 3D paint node to my color and I am gonna add some, some rust to this, uh, this model, right? So what I wanna do, since I'm working from that original, uh, the second method that I showed you guys earlier where I'm actually dropping the 3D paint into my material graph, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pull my, my file that I've sourced, my rust, pull it into the material graph and I'm gonna throw it onto my color input. And as you can see, my color input actually changed right there. Uh, and I also have it inside the material graph. If I was working the other way, we wouldn't see this in the material graph, it would just be there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch between these. If you notice there was a black, my, my, my brush stroke was a little black there. Sometimes if you don't have this set up, it doesn't read it immediately. Easy way to do it is just switch between them and it'll pop back immediately. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you how I would go about using this workflow. I'm gonna create a drip on the side here. So we're gonna run through paint, we're gonna run through stamp, and we're gonna run through eraser. If I'm painting, and this is how I would go about making a, a, a rust drip, uh, first thing I'm actually gonna to wanna to do is make sure that I have my brush shape squared away. If you wanna use a circular brush shape, that's great. I tend to make my own brush shapes uh, or source them online because I like having uh, something that's a little bit more irregular. So I'm gonna use this chip brush that I've created and I'm gonna paint with that. And now you'll notice that my brush is no longer circular. It's actually adopted the shape of uh, the PNG that I'm, I'm using to drive it. So in this case, I'm gonna add a little rust strip along this edge right here. Uh, one recommendation I have for you is work in performance mode. I have a pretty powerful computer at my disposal. I can get away without using performance mode, but even then it's still, it's it's more efficient and it, it just, it's a smoother experience if you're not using 
uh, if you are using performance mode over CPU or GPU. So I recommend being in performance mode while you're working and it's not gonna detract at all from what you're actually seeing in context of the, the texture. So right now I have my brush size. I think that's a decent size for me to, to paint over this little ridge. I'm gonna drop my opacity down a little bit. Typically I would start uh, somewhere around uh, 80% to 90% when I'm when I'm blocking things in. In this case, it's gonna be a really small drip and I kind of want that uh, change in opacity and I want different parts to be a little bit more more visible than other parts. So I'm starting with a little bit of a more opaque uh, brush. Once I have something roughed in like this, I can jump over to my eraser settings and then I will once again, maybe adjust my size a little bit just so I can get in here. And the real, the nice part about weathering is since weathering is irregular, it's kind of uh, uh, not planned out. You don't need to worry too much about how you're approaching it and leaving artifacts behind actually tends to uh, add a little bit more realism to your, your final product. As you can see, I'm just kind of clicking and, and pulling over. I am doing this with a mouse. Um, so it can be done with a mouse. I do recommend using a tablet. It just tends to uh, make things easier and you don't have to constantly be clicking um, to actually get your, your effect to, to come into play. And as you can see, I'm, I'm really not taking too much time and being uh, not super careful to get my, my effect. Um, I just envisioned this drip happening. You could have all kinds of drips happening all over the place, as you saw in that first uh, version that I showed you, which is the demo scene. Um, so I'm just going to kind of do this quick so you guys can get an idea of how that might look. So let's call that good for, for a drip. And I can adjust my bump as well. I like to always be using my bump input when I'm working with 3D paint. You can do that from uh, the actual textures tab just by alt dragging over your 3D paint onto your, your bump. And then once that's set up and I have my, my performance mode off, typically you're gonna get a little bit of highlights hitting that, that rust texture and it's gonna give it a little bit more realism and uh, a textural element to it. So definitely be using your bumps if you're trying to patina or weather, it, it adds quite a bit to your, to your rendering. Okay, so back to performance mode, we've added a drip. Now I wanna put a general air of rust and, and coverage over the entire thing. So I'm gonna go over my 3D paint. You can see that this is the top layer. My layer background color is blue. Um, this is where you would actually go ahead and, and change your, your background color if you wanted something. And as you can tell, when I changed that, it happened to the base. It didn't affect my rust at all. So everything that's being done via 3D paint is on top of your base color. So I'm gonna leave it at blue uh, and I'm gonna create another layer and we'll call this new layer coverage since the goal of this is just to give it a little bit of rust over the entirety of the model. So now that I'm in here, I'm going to go to my stamp tool instead of paint because what I'm gonna do is uh, hit this entire surface with a bunch of stamps of, of rust. I'll come back through and I will erase places where I feel like it's, we got some patterning going on or um, you know maybe I feel like there's too much buildup in one area. So I would kind of, just start clicking randomly. This is again, really subjective and artistic approach. Uh, so it's it's all about how you wanna do it. There's no uh, specifically right way, but this is how I approach uh, adding a little bit of, of patina to the entire thing. Now this is with my texture map, my rust texture map that I started with. Uh, I'm also gonna show you how to work with a label because I don't want everything to be isolated to just this rush texture. I also wanna have some corrosion that feels metallic and a few other things. So I'm gonna just call this good and I'll start erasing so you guys can get an idea of how I approach that. So we're, we got a bunch of rust on here. We have the bump attached to it, but it's a little heavy handed and I, I don't particularly want it to be this visible. So I'm gonna come in here with my eraser tool. I'll again, adjust my size because I don't wanna take off the exact same amount. And then I can adjust my opacity you know, to whatever I feel is necessary. Uh, in this case, things are a little heavy. So I'm gonna just go through everything and start knocking things down. If I see any patterned areas from the brush, I can pull uh, parts of that stamp off in just those areas until I start getting something that really feels like a, a background effect and just like maybe maybe this barrel was sitting out on top of a, a boat for an extended period of time and uh, the salt water started kind of getting to the to the surface. So that kind of gives you an idea of where I'd start with that. Now, 
I have my 3D paint set, I've created my, my rust layer, but I wanna give it some more corrosion. Now, another way you can work on your, your, uh, your 3D paint, I'm gonna pull these out of the way because these have nothing to do with 3D paint, is I'm gonna put a material and I'm gonna use, in this case, metal, and I'm gonna attach it as a label. So we're gonna drive our label using 3D paint rather than directly painting on the, the color or the diffuse layer. Uh, as you can see, I'm completely covered by the metal material that I chose to put on my label. And I'm gonna grab a uh, 3D paint texture to help drive this. So if I were to put that 3D paint texture on the color input, I'm gonna have the exact same result as I have up here, where I'm basically just painting on top of that metal color. That's not what I want. In this case, I want to actually paint with this material. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna drop it over onto the opacity input. And with the opacity input on, you can tell that nothing is visible. Basically what I'm gonna be doing is I'm, every place I stamp, that metal material is now going to visibly appear as the label. So I'm gonna go back over to my stamp tool. Uh, I'm gonna actually go to my 3D paint node for this one. And then I'm gonna to go to my stamp tool. In this case, we're back to a circular brush. So I wanna change that back to my chip brush. I'll go to my chip brush, I'll select that. Now we're good to go. Uh, if I start painting, this is set at 100%. So you're going to see like the metallic is very aggressive. Uh, it covers everything and you can't see through it. That's not exactly the effect I'm going for. And I don't actually want to use this metallic material, but I like working with it as a white color because it makes it really easy for me to see. So I'm going to start by dropping this down to the 20s again, and I'll crank this brush shape size up to maybe four millimeters. Perfect. Uh, and then I'll start again, dropping that... Uh, that uh, material over my entire model to create another layer of patina. And as you can see, this is a lot more aggressive than the rust that I was using. And that's mainly because this material I'm using is metallic, um, it's a really light color. So it's it's not very, very uh, hard to hide. It's, it's in your face. Uh, and you can also see that there's a lot of patterning going on because you can visibly see that brush. So again, just like I did last time, I'll switch over to my eraser and I'll start pulling out areas that I kind of feel are patterned or uh, too light or too dark. And I'll, I'll start knocking everything down until it matches uh, my vision for what I'd like to do. Maybe I don't want the key shot logo covered up that much. So I'll make sure that area is a little bit less aggressive. And I just kind of get this to whatever amount of, of visibility I feel works for my specific application. And then at this point, let's call this good. I want to make this feel like it's actual corrosion. In this case, this just kind of feels like a bunch of white stuff thrown onto it. So I'm going to go ahead and actually change my metal material. Unlike working on the diffuse uh, or the color input of a 3D paint, where I have to use the layer color to drive the base color of my, my model, here, when I'm working with opacity, I can change my material and my material color by working from the, uh, uh, the settings of that specific material. So in this case, I want something that's a little bit closer to the blue of my, my current model. Let's try to get something maybe a little darker. And the goal here is just to really show like another level of, of corrosion. Um, and again, I can throw on my bump texture to get a little bit more uh, texture. And as you can see, the, the texture already jumped up and now we have this whole other level. Right now, it's again looking really bright because I have my metal texture, but I can throw on some roughness and it starts feeling a little bit more uh, like actual corrosion rather than, you know, this painted bit on top of it. Uh, you can go really, really heavy, go all the way to one, and you're going to get that, that heavy corrosion look. But as you can see, with pretty little effort, I've gone from a really bare uh, barrel that that's, doesn't have a lot of texture to it to something that you know, really, really has layers and depth to it. And you can just keep doing this. You can add all kinds of different labels, uh, even more layers on your, your texture map of rust in different sizes. So it's, again, it's really artistic and you can kind of approach it whatever way suits your specific need. So that's it for this little guy right here. Um, I do want to jump into this real quick and talk about 3D paint one more time. Uh, just so you get an idea of the difference between the textures. So if I go to my material graph again, let's throw on a 3D paint node into my color. And then I'll show you the difference between painting with the texture input and painting with the uh, color input applied. So here we have our, our 3D paint. I'll go ahead and I'll change my brush color. In this case, I'm going to change it to that rust texture that I was using in the other, the other model. And then I'll go ahead and I'll paint it uh, just with that. Let's 
make this a little bit bigger. So even in the in the brushstroke preview, you can see there's a difference in how that's going to look. So when I paint on this thing, you can see that it's really making this snake-like effect. If you're working with gradient brushes or this is the kind of effect you're going for, uh, it's a great tool to use. But again, if you want to have that one-to-one -one texture, you need to approach it the way I did it in the last version, which is grabbing your texture model or your texture map and then dropping that onto your color. And then once that happens and I go to paint, I can actually paint that full texture in, which is basically the equivalent of uncovering it as a texture map if it was just dropped onto the diffuse. And then one last thing on this one, you can see that I've kind of overlapped onto that radius edge right there. If I were to use that only draw on plane checkbox right here, uh, it's basically just going to confine it so I can't get over that radius edge. So that becomes really useful if you are working with those converging planes or you don't want to get these edges. And what's nice is it really doesn't matter which surface you click on, it will automatically sense that that is the plane that you want to work on. So really useful. Um, I highly recommend kind of maximizing that if you are trying to keep things clean and do each individual surface.